On today's show, we visit with two grannies on the road and Jackie Millar of Terracura, pop up in our community, hear original poetry, learn about the Plymouth County Suicide Prevention Coalition, and talk about upcoming things to do in our area. We're glad you're here. Let's get started. The goal of Beth Soboloff and Marsha Rothwell is to see and share the best everything of every town in Massachusetts. And they do that on a show they produce called Two Grannies on the Road. It started out being uh, a project to fulfill my dream of wanting to travel. You know, I was at a point in my life where I had my own business and hadn't had a vacation for eight years and was kind of bemoaning the fact that I'd never gotten to travel across the country in an RV with my kids. And I was like, well, you know what? I can do web design from anywhere. Maybe I can find a way to combine work and travel. And I was single at the time, and I thought, well, it wouldn't be any fun to do it alone. Who could I drag along with me? And I thought of a friend of mine who was a graphic designer. She had her own business. She was a grandmother. She was lots of fun. And then the name came to me. Two grannies on the road. Start by telling us a little bit about your background. We started doing a local TV show interviewing baby boomers who had reinvented themselves and telling their stories to inspire other baby boomers to live their dreams. And things just evolved over time. Um, my, the first second granny retired. I had another second granny. I did guest grannies for a while and we were just traveling around towns. And um, she retired. In 2018, I said, let's visit every city and town in Massachusetts. So that's what we started doing. That became Two Grannies on the Road, it was a travel TV show. I went to a lunch with a small group of women. Um, I'd never met Beth a couple years ago. And we were sitting near each other and someone said, Beth, you need to tell Marsha about Two Grannies on the Road. And at that point, her second, second granny had um, just left. And she told me, and I said, oh, that sounds like that's right up my alley. <laughs> it's opened up a lot of opportunities to see new things and experience new things, that's for sure, um, and meet new people that we've never met and do things like ride around town in a Model A car or canoe races and ride in dog sleds, you know, see the world's largest collection of Back to the Future memorabilia with three DeLoreans. Who gets to do that? Pe most people don't know about it, and we get to do things like that. The people probably are the most important in what we've learned in friendships. We've slept at people's homes. They've put us up overnight. Um, and we've even gone back to a couple of people, and they've put us up again. And that's very sweet. It kind of restores your faith in humanity. You know, you hear so many bad things, and then you go and you meet these wonderful people that have been, you know, in a town their whole lives. They've lived there their whole lives. They love the town. They contribute. They help each other in so many ways, and it's heartwarming. So that, that's great. It restores your faith in humanity. I think it's actually very cool. There's going to be all this footage out there of me you know, talking and interviewing people. A lot of kids may not have, but maybe this will give them a different perspective of, you know, who I am and, and what I've done. But I hope it's also taught them that it's never too late to uh, pursue your dreams and that you should do things that you love. It's a, such a positive type of thing that you really um, go away very high the end of the day you know look at all these wonderful people we've met look what we've learned it's really very exciting I'm proud of the reactions that we get and the way that people react to the you know to the show is why am I crying <laughs> but people really enjoy our content and that that just makes me feel so good that we've shared something that is really interesting to people that they love We've helped local businesses because they actually get business from it. We never know how much, and it may only be a few people, but we know that people go and visit some of the shops and restaurants that we talk about, 
and give them business that they may never have done before. And that's, I love that. The Duxbury Rural and Historical Society is inviting you to take a stroll back in time. The historic Duxbury House Tour is a unique opportunity to tour the historic homes and grounds of five private residents, with each house stemming from a distinct era in the history of Duxbury. A detailed brochure will be given to each attendee with information about the history of these houses and the souls that lived within these homes' walls. There will also be objects on display from the DRHS collection, adding further nuance to the stories of these domiciles. All proceeds gained from the special tour will go toward the restoration, maintenance and improvements of Duxbury Rural and Historical Society properties. This event takes place on Friday, September 27th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Tickets must be purchased in advance at DuxburyHistory.org. The Pilgrim Hall Museum Speaker Series continues Wednesday, September 18th with artist Karen Ronaldo for Creating a Historical Painting, the First Thanksgiving. Ronaldo was commissioned in 1994, and her artwork is one of the first visuals to portray the presence of the Wampanoag at the first Thanksgiving in 1621 in a way believed to be close to factual. She will talk about her creative process and how she addressed the cultural issues and sensitivities around the creation of this piece, which ultimately was praised by the Society of Mayflower Descendants and Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, for its accuracy. A social hour and light refreshments will launch the event at 6 p.m. with the lecture commencing at 7 and lasting about an hour. You can purchase tickets through the Pilgrim Hall website. The cost is just $5 for members, $10 for non-members, and if you're a student with a valid ID, for free. The Pilgrim Hall Museum is located at 75 Court Street in Plymouth. The Plymouth County Suicide Prevention Coalition offers training and programs to help loved ones and community members recognize the signs of those at risk. Here's more on this important topic. So the um, Plymouth County Suicide Prevention Coalition was actually the ninth coalition that was formed through the uh, Department of Public Health, part of the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention. So. Other counties within Massachusetts also have coalitions. We noticed that Plymouth was not represented, Plymouth County, so they asked for funding because our funding does come from the Department of Public Health so that we could start the organization down here. We knew that there was a need um, and we put it to place in June of 2014. Um, the coalition has done a lot um, since the beginning. Um, we're, we're reaching our 10 year anniversary, which is awesome. Um, and they've done a lot of training in schools and in fire departments and police departments and mental health providers. Our staff had benefited from mental health first aid. Um, and it just is eye opening to have that training and, and learn about those processes and to have those tough conversations so that you feel better about asking certain questions and where, the, where you can help guide a person, um, you know, to not leave them alone if they're in crisis, how to help them in terms of getting them assistance. So they've been a huge help with education and training and building awareness for suicide prevention. My son suffers with mental illness. Um, when he was 16 years old, he actually attempted his life. Um, he's now 31, I will say, um, doing very, very well. So that's what made me aware of it. I really didn't know much about mental health and the issues that happen and how kids struggle. When we lost my niece, though, that really opened up my eyes. Um, again, my niece was, you know, 10 days shy of turning 16, and to try and comprehend how a 16 year old can have the thoughts that they had or she had or many have because we know others struggle. Um, I didn't want a family to go through what we went through. So I was adamant about doing something in the town. And I wanted to make sure that education was out there. And I, as soon as I became co-chair, at the time I was co-chair, um, you know, I, I did get certified in mental health first aid. I actually traveled to Washington, D.C. for the training. So I, I am a certified trainer through the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. 
In doing that training, I realized how important it is, not only just for the kids, but for older adults, for our first responders, for our veterans, for our active military, and anyone else in the community. People ask us all the time, who should be trained? And we say, everybody, everybody. Mental health is very important. Um, it intersects with OCS and several entities. Um, with protective services, because it is one of the underlying issues for elder abuse, um, as well as it intersects with the behavioral health programs that we run, where we're able to offer counseling. The behavioral health issues that are out there, there's a lot of stigma attached to them, suicide being one of them. Um, so that is one of the ways that we're trying to assist our older adults. The programs that we offer, um, there's several educational programs that we offer. Every single one of them is an evidence-based program. It's nothing that we have written. Some of them come right from Washington, D.C. Um, some of them are through the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and some are through a program called Living Works, which is out of Canada. Again, all evidence-based programs. You know, our hour and a half trainings, our 90-minute segments, um, we call them our Suicide 101 trainings. And it's just to give people a general idea on signs and symptoms, what to look for, what to watch for, and then how to ask that question. Are you okay? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you thinking of suicide? And neither one of those, you know, are you thinking of killing yourself and are you thinking of suicide? Those are very hard questions to ask. And I know it comes out of my mouth pretty easily, but I've been doing it now for nine years, basically. Um, it's important to ask that question. The um, eight hour training that we offer is called Mental Health First Aid. And that's one of our favorite programs that we like to offer. In Mental Health First Aid, we go over all the prominent mental health disorders. And then we also talk about suicide. We talk about suicide prevention. Again, those questions, how to ask them, what to look for. You know, we give resources at every class so that people know where to reach out, whether if it's for mental health, if it's for housing, if it's for a substance use abuse, we give everything out. We give out the National Suicide Prevention Number, which is now a three digit number, which is the 988. That's been in effect for two years now, since July of 2022. The calls that are going into there are 45% increase than the old 800 number that used to be. Um, so we push that a lot. The two-day training that we do, it's called Applied Suicide Intervention Skill Training, or ASSIST, and that's a very intensive two-day training that teaches you how to do an actual intervention. So if someone were in crisis, we would help you get through that. 90% um, of our trainings, I would even say 99% of our trainings are free to the Plymouth County community. We intersect with um, trying to navigate the system to help our older adults with suicide. The other piece is our staff. We wanna make sure that our staff are adequately trained um, and that they are able to have that tough conversation as Jenny had mentioned in terms of finding out where our, our people are at um, so that we can get them help. And suicide affects everybody. We always say it doesn't discrim discriminate. There's no socioeconomic discrimination. It affects everybody. It's trying to build rapport um, with trying to let people know and get comfortable with having that conversation and letting them know that we're there to help. Um, that it, there is a stigma with it, but it's okay to ask for help. Um, and that there's help available that will respond. You know, things can get better. Um, with the right type of, you know, assistance, whether it be counseling or support groups, stuff like that, um, and that, you know, things can get better. You can even text. You can text the number 741-741 and somebody will be on the other end. A lot of people, when they call the 988, they think that, oh, they're gonna know where I'm at. You know, it is anonymous. Part of the 988 initiative that happened in our state is there's now actually five call centers within the state of Massachusetts. There used to only be two, but now with 988, we have five different centers that take the calls that come into our state. One thing that people don't realize is if you're not in crisis 
or you're concerned about somebody, you can call that number and just say, I have a question. I'm concerned about somebody. The 988 number is our biggest link that we give out to people. With the 988 initiative, there was also another um, part of that that came out and it's through the Massachusetts Behavioral Health Helpline. And within that, there's actually 29 centers across the state of Massachusetts that can do an intake right then and there. You can walk in, you can call, they will help you. And it's not just um, for someone in crisis. If someone is, you know, struggling financially with food, with housing, they will help you. And the best part about the, Nas the Massachusetts Behavioral Health Helpline is they have 200 different languages that they can speak. 200 different languages. So those are the most resources that we give out. The, one of the biggest takeaways that I've learned over time is it's okay to talk about it. It is a hard topic. It is a hard question to ask. You know, is somebody okay? What can you do to help? Be a good listener. It's okay if you're not okay um, and we can help get you there. The biggest thing I think that I can take away from all of this is not to be afraid to talk about it. I said earlier, you know, my son struggled and, you know, he struggled at the age of 16. He was hospitalized. Um, as I said, he's now 31. He changed his college education from history and music to psychology. And he's now entering a master's program in psychology because he realizes how important it is to talk about it. That's the biggest thing I can say to anybody. If you're worried about your parent, your grandparents, your aunt, your uncle, you know, your military family, you know, they struggle all the time. Offer of that ear. It, it could be just a matter of listening, sitting down, talking to someone and listening. And like I said, if I meet one person at the fair that says, thank you, to me, my day's done. Joseph Campbell said, computers are like Old Testament gods, lots of rules and no mercy. If your computer skills could use some merciful help, you'll be interested in the Kingston Public Library's series of free basic computer classes. The first, using a keyboard slash mouse, starts on Thursday, September 5th, and will look at navigating Windows features such as icons, desktop, and the start menu. The focus for Thursday, September 12th class is internet searching, along with some lessons on browsers, links, and bookmarks. September 19th will be an introduction to email navigation, and the series will close out on September 26th with identifying internet scams and fake news. The classes are from 2 to 3 p.m. each week. There is space for five people and you can register through the library's website. This is a series that includes all four classes. For more information, please contact Stephen Miller, reference librarian at 781-585-0517, extension 6272. The black cat is out of the bag. Halloween is not just one evening of spooky fun, but a spine-tingling season. And Inebriart is kicking it off with a killer event on Friday, September 20th. Happening at the historic and haunted John Carver Inn, the hometown haunts and hops film festival will be an eerie evening of entertainment centered around the main attraction, a screening of the spooktacular 2013 cult classic WNUF Halloween special. Shot mockumentary style and set in the 80s, it follows an investigative journalist reporting on a house that was the scene of a grisly murder and is rumored to be haunted. There will be a meet and greet with the film's director, Chris LaMartina, giving fans of the film a rare opportunity to ask questions about this unique underground film, which he calls a love letter to VHS and public access TV. Complementing this fright-filled feature will be a creepily curated selection of bone-chilling short horror films from both emerging and seasoned filmmakers.
The Hometown Haunts and Hops Film Festival starts at 6 p.m. at the John Carver Inn in Plymouth. The ticket price covers all the screenings and special spooky surprises throughout the night. Get yours at the All Events website. We took in the sun and learned about sunflowers at the Plymouth County Sheriff's Horticultural Center with Jackie Millar of Terra Cura. Cura was founded about eight years ago. It's a nonprofit organization and we teach people about their food system and connecting with nature. The Horticultural Center has been a wonderful partner for us because we're able to use one of their greenhouses to start our plants. It's given us a space, a community garden for folks to be able to have a demonstration garden right outside their door and have the space for kids to really be able to be part of the process, which is great. So today we have a presentation that's going to, it's going to have three parts. We're going to read a book about a sunflower. We're going to make a sunflower craft so kids can understand what a sunflower looks like and how to create one. And then the third part, which is the most exciting part for me, we're going to plant the community garden here. And we have wonderful plants that we're going to put into the soil. And I think it's great for kids to understand where their food comes from. And that's the first step. we're reading today is a seed grows and it's all about sunflowers and the life cycle of a sunflower so what my goal is to pass out a sunflower seed so kids can see it and then we're going to read the whole book about how it grows and then how the seed itself at the end it could be used for a bird it could fall back into the soil or you could seed save with it as well so sunflowers to kids a lot of times are just what the baseball players put in their mouths and spit out but it has another purpose that I think is much more deep and, and wonderful Birdies eat them. They don't. They eat them actually, and then they spit them out. Cause some of some um some parts of it are ac they yucky. Cause they spit it out. So. Yeah. And sometimes they don't eat all the seeds yeah. and the sunflowers. And then what do those sunflowers turn into? They turn into seeds. new. New yeah. sunflowers, right? New sunflowers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, sunflowers, they make you smile, and they also follow the sun. So if you ever watch a sunflower from morning to night, it turns its head towards the sun. So I think kids really need to start looking at nature, connecting with nature, and then participating in nature as well. So sunflowers, to me, are a great plant. It's a great flower, and it's a great activity. And just to watch how big it grows, the mammoth sunflowers that we're going to plant today, they go between 8 and 10 feet. That's a big sunflower. But I think it's important for kids to understand that something so small can get that big. And that's kind of an encouraging lesson for kids, right? I liked um, planting, planting the, um, the plants in the ground and seeing the wormy. Yes, my favorite part of the day was definitely spending time with my daughter, Amelia, and getting our hands dirty, getting in there and actually planting uh, here in the nice community garden. So the goal always is for kids to take these lessons and bring them home, whatever that may look like. You can do it on the deck, in a pot. If you have a backyard, encourage your parents to maybe have a little plot of land that you can put some food into. So for me, having kids see it and then they want to do it, really radiates out, so it's going to change the lifestyle of both the child and the family. What's your favorite thing about gardening? Um, my favorite thing about gardening is um, you get to see the wormies and all the things in the ground, and you got to plant the seeds, and then after they grow, you can see the bumblebees, which are so fat and cute. My favorite thing about gardening is just uh, getting your hands, again, dirty and that connection with uh, our surrounding and nature's and kind of bringing forth something into our environment that benefits with all the pollinators uh, in a time when we need it the most. The goal 
for us, again, is to use the, the community garden demonstration area to do more of this type of work. We're hopeful to do a Three Sisters garden in the next few weeks. And the Three Sisters garden is an indigenous planting method with the corn going straight up, the beans wrapping around it as the trellis, and then squash, any type of squash plant down at the bottom. So we're hoping to do that in the next couple weeks to, again, teach kids about methods of planting and, again, connecting with their food system. really appreciate uh, everybody having an event like this for us. It's great. Uh, the local farm, the, the sheriff's farm here is a, just a, a welcome addition to the town and we're really appreciative of that as well as, as this program. So we, we really appreciate this and more to come. Creativity and community are at the heart and soul of Tolson's Tap and Tavern Shop Local Marketplace, a gathering of Pembroke's finest artisans, makers, and crafters. Taking place on Saturday, September 14th, this is the event to find unique, one-of-a-kind, handcrafted gifts and art. Shop local and enjoy the sumptuous seasonal wines and delicious food Tolson's Tap and Tavern has to offer. The local market runs from 11 to 4 p.m. Tolson's Tap and Tavern is located at 15 Columbia Road in Pembroke. Priscilla Beach Theatre proudly presents a production of the Tony Award-nominated musical, They're Playing Our Song, written by Neil Simon, with music by Marvin Hamlish and lyrics by Carol Bayer Sager. Opening on Friday, September 6th, this romantic comedy is based on the real-life story of Hamlish and Sager, a snappy tale following the ups and downs of the working and personal relationship of a composer and lyricist that ultimately evolves into true love. The show runs from September 6th through the 14th, starting at 7.30 p.m., with a 2 p.m. matinee on Sunday, September 8th. Tickets can be purchased through the theater's website at pbtheater.org. Next up is poet Jen Pip from her performance at the Plymouth Poetry Festival, hosted by America's Hometown Laureates. Jen Pip. Thank you. This time I remember to say the next right, I hope I am as, as on top of it as you are. So yes, I am Jen Pip. Um, I'm going to read three poems. I'm going to stick right, get to it. Thank you so much for having us here. It's a beautiful event. Um, we're going to start with a poem called Token. Becoming, becoming, that's what we're humming, singing the words that we speak. Becoming, becoming, that's what we're dumbing, effortless work at its peak. Becoming is saming, the signal is marching, the troops have found the fort. The damsel is broken, there is no token, the game lays to waste at your court. Beclaiming and ramping and running for funning, the boys push the girls off the cliff. The riot is ready, the talk is quite heady, the clubhouse is dirty and stiff. Bespeckled and seeking, you're flanking, you're ranking, the fight matters not, it turns out. The pixels will flicker, the tune is a clicker, the algorithm bounces about. The game ain't your wisdom, the game ain't you're wanting and you blame the women alone you ran to take cover without a new lover empty and left to atone bemoaning you're fading alone and not dating you wonder who never said hi the evenings are empty the phone isn't ringing and you now you just yell at the sky <laughs> all right those ones are always a little tough because there's a lot of momentum this one uh has a different kind of momentum so this is called because I write because my blood flows to my fingertips. My blood flows to my heart. My blood flows to my lungs and becomes my voice that hits the tiny metal discs in my phone and then evaporates. I write because I'm alive. I write because I will die. I write because I didn't know you were possible. I write because I want to find you. I write because someday I will meet you. I write because I want to live. I write because they lied to me. I write because they stole everything. I write because I disappeared. I write because there was no space beyond my pen. I write so I don't forget. I write because I want to live. I write to stop my self-hatred. I write to invite it in. I write to get to know it. I write to become myself. I write because I want to live. I write because the trees have always been here. I write because the forest is watching. I write because they tell me their secrets. I write because there has 
what has been will crumble into the ocean. I write because the sky will tear away what doesn't belong to us. I write because the movements of the earth hold the roots of justice. I write because no one can stop me. I write because I write. All right, and our fangle, fangle one, also our final one, is called Bang. Um, uh, okay, so. We were once all smaller and smaller and smaller. We were once so small they were almost nothing at all. Tiny pieces of life, barely just there. If you flash backwards, is there ever nothing? Does that make more sense than always something? Always something alive, making something alive, even if it was tiny? Back when there was only bacteria, only plants, only atmosphere, only electricity, only not only knows how the universe folds, how time weaves, how to spark, think, feel, see, we don't ask. We just believe the rich 3D renderings of the universe banging into existence. Okay, back to Earth 2022. I am 42, oops, 43. Either way, it's somewhere in between the very beginning and infinity. Over the last year, it struck me that it has become more and more clear I will not pull a thread of DNA from my strand and pass it into someone else's hand. How narrowly we define the distribution of DNA, the family line, the race, the region. What happens if I survive, but we don't? In this global age, the DNA of Earth is my parameter. The mother web, that is my lineage. The end. But bang, here it is again. So see, was the bang really the beginning? It's hard concept to swallow. Best gulp it down. Bang, and we get a second chance, a third chance. It's hard to know how long this has been happening. How long has the universe been banging? Are we in the middle of an infinite cycle, missing the twisting spinning of the planet, pushing the stars around the globe with our heads tucked deep into our little houses? Are wires tied together like the shoestrings of thrifty strangers sending signals around this earthen dome? Bang. The seas are rolling as our feet touch the ground again. We know that people have come before and people will come after. Children drag sticks behind them as they trace the edges of the universe. Townspeople gather around the fire and look for messages in the sparks. Little is said because words are no longer necessary. We sing the song of the story of the land, which is the story of the universe. We learned it from the whales the year we learned to listen. That was the year we untied the wires. That was the year we learned to dream. Part of the joy of having a vegetable and herb garden is the reward of eating the fruits or veggies of your labor. Wouldn't it be great to plan meals from your garden all year long? You can, and the solution to being able to partake in the pleasure of your pickings beyond the growing season can be found in cans and jars. On Tuesday, September 17th, the Plymouth Public Library will host Jackie Millar from Terra Cura and Lori Walsh from Time for Wellness to demonstrate a variety of simple methods to preserve your bountiful harvest of herbs and vegetables. A quick and easy pickling recipe and a delicious herb pesto recipe will be featured. The class will meet in the Phalo Room at the Plymouth Public Library from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Register via the library's website. The summer concert series at the Pembroke Council on Aging continues on Monday, September 16th with local musician Aidan Keane to fill the room with sound. We all know that songs have the power to crack open the memory bank and take you back in time. Get ready for some nostalgia. Keane's specialty is as a singer and a tribute artist, and he'll be playing classic popular tunes from the 1950s all the way to the 1970s. The show begins at 5.30 and he'll perform for about an hour. The council is located at 128 Center Street in Pembroke. Next up is Michaela Clark and the Local Scene Street Team with the third installment of our pop-up at Plymouth Pride. What does it mean to be a part of the LGBTQ plus community? I think it's a bit of that as well, but I think it's also a lot about um, showing up for everybody. It's all about everyone's liberation. Um, half of the profits that I'm making today are being donated to immediate Palestinian relief. Um, all the GoFundMe's and different families that I've been working with. Um, and I think that pride is just as much about showing up for other people as it is showing up for one community. Um, 
I think all of our liberations are interconnected, so I think it's really important that as we celebrate Pride, we celebrate everybody and we're working for united liberations and complex liberations as well, because it's not simple. Olivia, what does it mean to you to be a part of the LGBTQ plus IA community? It means, oh, I mean, obviously it means a lot to me, but it's the first place where you kind of just feel immediately accepted. You know, everyone's ready to just be there for you while you're figuring out who you are, you know? And it's a really good community to be a part of. It's a really safe community to be a part of, which is really important, but yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What advice do you have for someone who's just coming out? You know, community is a big thing to us, and, and me being an ally is connect yourself with people that are going to accept you for who you are and um, strengthen numbers and, you know, just uh, be as safe as possible and seek out safe, safe havens and safe people. So, Charlotte, what is your advice to someone just coming out? Do it at your own pace, do it when you feel comfortable, and do it to someone who you feel safe and comfortable with. It's more important to do it on your own time and to embrace your full self when you have embraced yourself. So if you have a friend who you feel safe talking to, then that's who is okay to come out to first. It doesn't necessarily have to be family if they don't make you feel safe in coming out. It should be at your own pace and when you're comfortable. And there you have it, the fourth annual Plymouth Pride Festival. See you next year. And that, my friends, wraps this episode of what's good and good to know in our area. Thank you for watching. We also thank our patrons, Tiny and Sons, Quintal Brothers, and Squinny's Pizza for supporting our mission of community and action through media. We'll see you on the local scene. For more of what's good and good to know on the South Shore of Massachusetts, hit the subscribe button and thank you for watching.